Well, good morning, Walden Church. I don't know how often I get to say this or how many of you might know this, but my wife and I, Joanna, we work a lot in the wedding business. I, of course, get to marry a lot of people. I get to meet couples. Uh, I get to help them plan their special day. I get to go to the various venues that are around the Montgomery Conroe area. And of course, I work with a lot of other vendors like DJs and wedding planners uh, that are out there in the field. Joanna makes all the paper, so she makes all the um, invitations, she makes maps, she makes announcements, she makes placeholders, everything, all the way down to the paper fans you'd fan yourself with on a hot day. So naturally, what's happening in the wedding world is of keen interest to us. We're always watching uh, trends, watching uh, uh, how things change and shift throughout uh, the year, and there's also, you know, of interest to us, a lot of wedding language in the Bible. And so we become more aware of that uh, when we read it. Jesus once told a story. He told a parable about a great wedding, and there were 10 young women who were invited to be part of the wedding party. And it's a very strange story that Jesus tells, and I was hoping we could read it together and talk about it a little bit, and just maybe we could shed a light on our journey as a church and then think about what we can begin to do as the new school year is upon us, any new ministries we would start at Walden Church. Jesus teaches at the beginning of Matthew chapter 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the five foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, help open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. When the first people heard this parable, they would not have been confused at all. Weddings were a very big part of their culture, so much so that little children would play wedding or they would play funeral out in the streets because it was so much a part of their lives. But as you can tell, weddings in the first century, uh, very different. Weddings in Israel, very different than weddings today. Firstly, because weddings back then were arranged weddings, right? It was an arranged marriage. The father of the groom would be looking for a suitable bride for his son. And when he found a young girl that he thought was a good fit, the groom's dad went to the bride's parents with a mohar. The mohar is an offering. It's the price that you were willing to pay. It's the offering. It's this first gift between the parents. After all, the parents of the bride, they're gonna lose somebody from their family. They're gonna use somebody who's young, lose somebody who's a strong worker. And so this bride has value. And because she does chores, she has purpose, all of that would no longer be done. So the groom's parents offer the mohar. And if the bride's family agrees, then that's a good match. The groom's dad, he arranges for the two to meet, again, going back to the bride's house. This time, the groom brings a gift for the bride. And today, you and I would call this the engagement ring. And it's called the Kedushin. Uh, Rabbi David says, when we recite in our prayers, God who sanctifies us, we may interpret it, God who married us. For the Hebrew root of both the word sanctified and married is Kedush. So the groom now takes a plain gold ring and places it on the finger of the bride and recites this out loud in the presence of the witnesses. He says, behold, you are sanctified or betrothed to me with this ring according to the law of Moses and Israel. So the ring symbolizes this concept of the groom encompassing, protecting, providing for his wife. And then they bring out a legal document that's drafted. We would say this is the marriage certificate 
and it is called the Kativa, and the Kativa is read out loud, and usually by another honoree, and it would have all the terms listed out, and then it's all given to the bride. At this point, even though we might say they've entered into an engagement, right? We'd say that today. Back then, the couple is now legally married. If they wanted to call it off from this point on, they would now need to draft a new document for divorce. At this point, the groom leaves and he works on their future home for about a year. Why a year? Well, first, he has to build the house, right? But second, it was to prove that during that time, the bride was not pregnant. And this would help you understand even the story behind Jesus' birth, right? Because at the very beginning of Matthew, it says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, that means they're married. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit and her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Mary and Joseph were legally married when the angel visits Mary and she's supposed to be waiting for Joseph to come and call her. If during this time she is found to be with child and Joseph says, the child's not mine, this would have brought great shame on both families. Mary could have been put to death. Also during this year, the groom is building the house and it's kind of more of a, an addition onto his parents' house where the two of them are gonna live. And ladies, that sounds very exciting, right? Not only are you going to live in your in-law's house, but uh, you get to live in your husband's old bedroom after he takes down his Rolling Stone posters and hangs up a few curtains. It's every lady's dream, right? <laughs> How long does it take for the groom to build the home? Well, he's done when his dad says he's done. In other words, it's dad's house, and if he's gonna have a new person sleeping under his roof, then he wants his son to do the job right. But if you're the groom, you're building as hard and as fast as you can because you want to hurry the process. You want to speed the day. All this means is the bride does not know when her wedding day is. Her job is to wait. Her job is, most of all, to be ready. Does she have any clue when this will happen? She has a little bit of a clue. In Talmudic times, Sunday and Wednesday were especially good marriage days because the court meets on Monday and Tuesday. So any contention, if they were gonna dispute her virginity, then you could take that to the courts the next day. So having your wet wedding on a Wednesday night, that's a good night. But other than that, she has no clue. Her first indication that this is her wedding night will be lights and sound coming down the street. Her wedding day starts with the groomsmen and the bridal party carrying these torches filled with oil. Why do they need torches? Because the groom always comes like a thief in the night, literally in the middle of the night to steal the bride away. Nowadays, the wedding is all about the bride and her mom, right? The groom is just a prop in a suit get uh, you know, a nice suit and put on a smile, remember to thank people and shake hands. That's the groom's only job. The wedding is her special day. But in Jesus' day, <laughs> the wedding was the groom's party. And if it was the groom having to do the plans, well, then me and my friends, we're gonna come down the street in our hot rods with our music blaring and our lights flooding the street. We're gonna pull up to the house, we're gonna honk the horns and we're gonna yell for you to come out and once you come out, we're gonna do donuts in the lawn and we're gonna burn rubber all the way home. And that's pretty much what these young men did. So if you're living back then and you happen to hear this big commotion outside, the bridal party coming down the road, blaring the shofar horns and carrying torches, you would leave your house and join the parade because you would wanna be there to see the bride's face when she realizes that today is the day. And when they get to the house, they'd all blow the ram's horn and they would shout in unison, here is the groom, come out to meet him. Right? One, two, three, move that bus. Of course. And immediately, the bride is gonna go get on her dress. 
She's gonna do her hair and makeup, and she's gonna get out there as fast as she can. The quicker the better, because the entire town is outside her door right now. And she would want the rumor to be that she was ready. Then the entire parade goes in reverse, goes back to the groom's house, drums, trumpets, and an all night party that spills out into the next week. How long did the party last? It lasts for as long as the groom's parents have food and wine. If the food and wine run out, party is over. Maybe you remember a story about Jesus going to a wedding with his family and the wine ran out and the family was going to be embarrassed. The longest the party could go was a week because with the wedding going on, commerce is shut down, everyone has the day off. So your boss would literally give you the week off to go to this party. Well, when we look at the parable, we are reminded, of course, that Jesus is the bridegroom. He says in Luke 5, you cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom, talking about himself, fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? And so he is the bridegroom, then naturally we must be the bride. In Revelation 19, 7, it says, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. So that means then that God is the father and that he has paid the price for our release. But the big difference is that Jesus' commitment to us goes far beyond a wedding ring, far beyond a paper contract, all the way to the point of his own life. And now Jesus has gone away. John 14, he says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. So he goes to prepare a place for us to return only on the day that he knows. Matthew 24 says, but concerning that day, an hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but the father only. Revelation 16 says, behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake. And so we must be ready for the party that is to come. Revelation 19 says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty pearls of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory of the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So we are all tracking now, right? We are all tracking now. We are all on the same page. So what's going on with the wise and the foolish girls? Because when you read this, there seems to be a lot of unfair things going on. First, it's sad that five girls run out of oil, but then it's also sad that five other girls won't share. And even after they get oil and they go back to the wedding, the groom doesn't let them in and he says, go away, I don't even know you. What's going on in Jesus's parable and what can we learn from it? Well. Let's put it into our perspective, okay? Let's say you've been invited to a wedding party and the host says, don't bring anything. What are you gonna bring? <laughs> Something, right? You, you bring a bottle of wine, you bring a bag of chips, you bring a hors d'oeuvre, you bring a liter of Pepsi. Why do you do that? To help. To help who? Yourself? No. You bring it because you want to help the host. You care about them. You care about their event. You want their event to be fun. You want their event to be a success and you want to contribute something. This is why the five girls won't share. What is the oil for? It's for the bride and groom. It's their job to light the entire way. So that there's light all the way back to their home and they know they only have enough for themselves to light the entire way. So they're not gonna give up their oil because if they do, then the bride and groom won't have their path lit all the way home. The five wise girls are not selfish. 
They care about the bride and groom, and they want to do their part. So they have to keep the road lit, and because they were wise, they brought extra just in case. Now, my wife and I are wired differently. My wife is an extrovert. She loves to spend time with people. I'm an introvert. I like to spend time at my house. So when she says, can I go on a trip without you? I say, go for it. But when I know she's coming home, one of my favorite things to do is to prepare the way for her. I don't want her to come home just to a clean house, but also an organized house. I might even paint something that she said, we should paint this, or hang a picture that she's been asking me to hang, or hang a shelf. I want my wife to be happy when she returns home, so I prepare the way. Jesus tells another parable in the same chapter. The second one is the parable of the talents and the master who leaves his home and finances and trusts them to the servants. And the point of the story was, what did you do while the master was away? Did you invest his money or were you scared and did you just bury it in the ground? And then the story right after this is about his return, his second coming and who he says, sit at the banquet table with me, and then who he says, depart from me, I never knew you. It's a very chilling, very eye-opening message. Matthew chapter 25. You should read the whole thing this week. Jesus is going away, and he's entrusting his affairs to us, and he expects to find his affairs in order when he returns. Second Peter 3 says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Is this possible? Can we hasten the coming of the day of God? Can we speed up Christ's return? He is the groom, and he's waiting patiently for the bride to get ready waiting for as many to be saved as can be saved. What if the future return of Christ will come when the bride has made herself ready? And if that's the case, how can we speed that along? Should we be investing our master's money, making sure our lamps are well lit? And if so, what does that mean? The kids are going back to school this week. And that means fall's coming, that means kickoff, that means homecoming, that means new starts, that means new beginnings. The lazy days of summer are over, and it's time for everyone to get back to work. And that includes the work of the church. And as a church, we should be stepping back, we should be asking ourselves, are we preparing his bride? Are we preparing the bride to meet the groom? As a church, we cannot lose our grand calling to prepare ourselves for Christ's return. Our church does not do many weddings here, uh, probably less than 10 a year. And so we do not have a bride's room. We don't have a bride's chamber. But in essence, that's exactly what our entire church should be, a place where we are making ourselves and making the world ready for Jesus. Sadly, most churches act like country clubs. It's a privilege to join. It gives you a status and a perk, and there's a membership roster, and there's a network of friends once you join, and maybe we might not ever say it out loud, but secretly, uh, we hope that not everybody notices us over here because we don't want to lose uh, our favorite seat. If there's a lot of people, we don't want to lose our favorite parking space. In John chapter 3, we see John the Baptist at the very beginning of Jesus' story. And it says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. You know, if a king or an emperor was coming to your town, then first a herald would come and announce that and let you know that he was on his way. And you had a timeline. You had to get ready for his arrival. And quite literally, a team would be dispatched to go out and fix the roads. You'd make the road as flat 
and as even and as straight as possible. And this would be hot, backbreaking work. So, do you want more people to help you or less? Many hands make light work. The more the merrier. And as soon as we get this road cleared, the king can come. We can hasten his coming. Our vision as a church must always be to embody this calling, to prepare the way, to be way preparers, not waiting for God, not waiting for Jesus. He's waiting for us. What can we do? I think we need to be a wise oil bearer. We need to be people who are preparing the bride, making the path straight. Have you ever read Proverbs 31? It's very popular, right? It's this poem about the perfect woman, or really it's the perfect wife. I want to read it to you. Proverbs 31 says, The woman who fears the Lord, an excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works the willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strengths and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself, her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known at the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to do the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. How true is the opening line of this Proverbs passage. A wife of this caliber, does she even exist? Right? That's how this poem starts. Who could find such a wife? And she is most certainly the woman that every man would want to marry. And she is certainly the wife that every woman aspires to be. She is confident. She is trustworthy. She is a hard worker. And yet she's also compassionate. She works in the home and she has her own business. Her children call her blessed. Her husband praises her for the works of her hands. In short, she is superwoman. She is wonder woman. Who could possibly be so complete in every aspect of their life? It makes me tired reading all the accolades of this noble woman. And I'm sure it makes some women ashamed of seeing where they lack in so many areas, especially in the domestic area. I mean, this woman is what, spinning thread and making garments. I wonder how one person could possibly live up to the standards of Proverbs 31. And then it dawned on me. Perhaps this passage is not simply about one woman and the work of a singular wife. What if there's a bigger picture here? Maybe there's a message in this passage that is not just for the women of this world, but also a message for the church. What if we look at this passage about the wisdom and work that is needed in order for the church to become the noble wife, the virtuous wife, a wife of good character, and the bride of our Savior? Then we would just insert the word church into Proverbs 31. And then it would sound like this. Christ is the groom of his church, and he has full confidence in her. For the church brings him good and not harm all the days of her life. 
The church works with eager hands, providing food for her family and for the servants. The church sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for the tasks and her lamp does not go out at night. The bride of Christ opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. And many other groups do noble things, but the church surpasses them all. Now, suddenly, this list of seemingly impossible things for one person now sounds very possible for the church. We, as the church, are to be a people who are united and who are working for the glory and the praise of our groom when he returns. We, as the church of Christ, are to be less concerned with what the world thinks of us and more concerned with the nobility that is listed here. Sadly, there's so many congregations and they're just competing with each other. For some reason, we've begun to lose sight of the common mission that we have to keep our lamps burning and to prepare the way, not to bring glory to ourselves, but to bring glory to God. That means that success for the church is not about which congregation has the most members or which building is the most state of the art. Success of the church is compared with this, with the noble wife, not measured by vanity and outward appearance, but rather by how well we live and the world that we help shape. The church is called to be this noble wife of Proverbs 31. The English priest, William Temple, he said the church is the only cooperative society in the world that exists for the benefit of its non-members. In other words, just like the virtuous wife of Proverbs 31, the church exists for the benefit of other people, not to drive others away by our vanity, not to be praised by the outside world. Rather, the church is to be the conduit for the gospel of Christ to flow into the world, to transform everything that she comes in contact with. So how are we doing? Are we uh, a congregation, a church that is living up to this calling of being noble and virtuous? Are we serving? Are we vigorous? Do we open our arms to the poor? Do we extend our hands to the needy? Are we clothed with strength, with dignity? Are we speaking with wisdom? Are we being faithful in all our instruction? Does the noble work of the church surpass all the humanitarian work of the nonprofits and the government agencies? A wife of noble character, who can find her? Who can find the bride of Christ in the world that seeks to give all praise and glory to her Lord without retaining any of it for herself? The church is called to be selfless in its giving. We are called to live by God's wisdom. We are to be the virtuous wife. We are to be the embodiment of noble character above all other institutions. To be honest, trustworthy, filled with mercy and grace, welcoming of all people, supportive of all those, especially those whose society has pushed away. James 3 says the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is the picture of the noble bride of Christ in the world. May the church seek to be noble. May we strive to be virtuous. May we live all of our days bringing glory to God and embody God's wisdom in the world. Live as God calls us to live. Love as Christ calls us to love. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your calling upon your church, and we thank you for your bride. We ask that we would continue to prepare her for your coming, that we would make the path straight, make the roads ready, and adorn your bride as she comes out to look beautiful and ready for her husband. May your church be virtuous. May your church be selfless. May your church have wisdom. May your church be a place of nobility. 
May your church be pure. May your church be bringers of peace. May your church be impartial. May your church be a place of mercy. Lord, above all other institutions and government agencies, may your church be the instrument of change. May we bring the gospel to the four corners of the earth, all with a loving message and loving actions, being the perfect example of your Son in all things we do and say. We are your church every single day, every single moment, until we hasten the day so that you can come again. Amen. Hey, we thank you for coming out and worshiping with us today. And we just want to remind you that we are here uh, in Montgomery, we are in Walden, and we would love to have you be a part of our congregation. We have two services, one at 9.30, we have a choir. We're gonna sing traditional hymns. We're gonna sing the doxology. We're gonna do responsive readings. We're gonna say the Lord's Prayer. We're gonna have communion. It's gonna feel exactly like the church you grew up in. Our second service is at 11, and it's a modern service. We have a worship team. Please come as you want, come casual. Come comfortable. Uh, we've got a full children's program from birth all the way through high school, and we would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.